Hi, I'm John Groders. Karen Whiting knows what it takes to raise a family, and she knows what it means to move them around. Her late husband, Jim, served 22 years in the Coast Guard, and her family was uprooted often. And through it all, Karen learned to tell stories. Her 25 books for women, children, and families share her heart and her creativity. Meet her today on No Shame. Have no shame. So we're back in the hallway at ICVM. This is the No Shame Podcast. And my guest for this episode is Karen Whiting. When you think of writing, think of Whiting. Did I get that right? You certainly did, John. I heard you say that in front of the whole group last night. Uh, So I guess it goes without saying, Karen, that you're you're a writer. Is that right? Yes, I am now. That's not what I expected to do in life. Oh, really? Well, I'm a mathematician, actually. That makes no sense. A mathematician? (laughs) Yes. Wasn't that the left side of your brain and writing is the other side of your brain? I guess, but mine always meshed together anyway growing up, and it still does. And the writing keeps me organized and on deadline. Oh, my goodness. Well, you're unusual. I'm a writer and definitely not a mathematician, so much so that I insisted that when we put the awning out in front of our business that we wrote out the words 16... Well, you know, or 17 West 6th Street in longhand because I didn't want numbers. But so, Karen, um, we've, we've actually run into each other a couple times already at this conference. I was in a small group with you right now, and you've been prolific in this writing, right? So give me a little of your autobiography. Well, I have had 26 books published, over 800 articles that I've sold, and I've written in-house, like, children's puppet scripts for Charisma for a children's church program and lots of other different things that of course I did not expect to do but it's been a fun type of thing and it's brought me to various places in the world. Well didn't expect to do you don't accidentally write 800 articles in 26 (laughs) books you must have noticed you become a writer at some point. Yes God called me to write he was very strong about that even gave me a vision while I was on a retreat praying should I really write and the next morning I kept moving where I should sit for breakfast and after breakfast we flipped out had to flip over our placemats and they were all unique paintings and mine was of my vision with Proverbs 3 5 on it and I said all right I will trust in you and not lean on my knowledge I don't have any for writing and he put a writer in my life to be a walking partner I started going to conferences and really just, I said I would listen to whatever anyone had to say. If nothing got published in five years, I'd know I didn't hear right. But within five years, I had contracts for five books. So I will continue until God tells me to stop. So I want to talk about being a writer. Now, on our podcast, we've interviewed over the years, uh, you know, actors, directors, writers, athletes, uh, singers, all kinds of people in the arts. But... Most people in the movie business, I mean, will say it's all about the script. I mean, the writer is really, I think, the the farmer who plants the seed in so many of the things that this whole industry is built on. You know, I mean, I fancy myself a writer. Karen, I have not written 26 books, but I know that when the time comes that that blank page is going to stare back at me and I am going to dive into it. How do you dive into the blank page. What's your process? What's your writing room? When I first have an idea, I start writing things down, kind of a brainstorming thing of why I would want to do it, who's it going to benefit, why would a reader want that book? And then that math part of me comes in and I do a spreadsheet and I put down what would I put in there. Even if it's, say, a 365 day devotional, I will write down the scriptures and the theme for every day for the 365 into that spreadsheet or for a children's the activities they would do with each of the things. So when that's done, I can not only write a proposal, but from that, I can write the whole book once I have the contract. So you've written how many different genres? Tell, tell me what a genre is and tell me how many different ones you've written. <laughs> well, I mainly write non-fiction books. Okay, and so that's my you, you, when you're looking at fiction and nonfiction. But because I've written historical nonfiction and I've written children's nonfiction, including inspirational craft books as well as parenting books, there's within that I, there's sort of these other subgenres you might say. 
And I'm not sure that I've ever counted how many types, but I have done several different things. So out of your 26 books, Nate, tell me about three of them. Titles, All right. summaries. The Gift of Bread. Okay. Recipes for the Heart and the Table. Growing up in restaurant business and loving bread making, as well as loving Jesus, the Bread of Life, this combines that of having 60 recipes, having heartwarming stories around bread, and having biblical insights into bread in the Bible. Then there's stories of faith and courage from the home front. As a military wife, a girl whose dad had served in World War II, who had relatives in and out of the military, and two a son and a son-in-law who served, my heart was for those families, as well as my dad. I mean, my granddad was a firefighter for 40 years. I had law enforcement relatives, all sorts of people. So with that and the military part, I first wanted to do that book of stories of faith and courage of what happened to the women, the American history on the home front of American wars, starting with 1755 and the French and Indian War, and going to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I did that and had to get a co-author. It's a really big book, 600 pages. <laughs> and that book has stories that you won't find anywhere. You might know about General Custer, but you don't know about his wife. You don't know about Mary Todd Lincoln's dressmaker and what she did after the Civil War. There are so many rich stories that need to be told of women who forged America for us and with us and made a difference. And then the other component of that for the families is I did my recent book of um, 52 weekly devotions for families called to serve. And that brings in different stories of children that are in families of the military, firefighters and everything, to learn what it means to serve and commit your life. So both of those are the similar type things, for this, but yet one is for those people who love history and the other is for the family. So that's just three, but I appreciate you mentioning those. The Gift of Bread, Stories of Faith and Courage from the Home Front, and 52 Weekly Devotions for Families Called to Serve. I'll say one thing, you don't write short titles for your books, do you? <laughs> no. My goodness, that will not fill on a marquee. If you're going to do movies, we need to discuss this. Yes, um, it's kind of hard to share with our listeners uh, the essence of an author, but I want to give it, I want to try. So I've got in my hands this uh, big book with the ragged pages called Stories of Faith and Courage from the Home Front, from the French and Indian Wars to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I've randomly opened to the page of March 27, and uh, it says African Americans in 1812. So I'm interested in this because I'm working on a movie from the War of 1812. And listen to just uh, an excerpt from this book. She says, General Andrew Jackson recruited free men of color to serve in the army with a promise of equal pay. And then there's a quote that you quoted Andrew Jackson. And then you said, after the Battle of New Orleans, Jackson praised his soldiers of color. And then you have another quote. And then you close by saying, 353 African Americans enlisted and formed into six company battalions and a major Vincent Populus served as the ranking officer. He was the first to reach that rank. And you go on to kind of highlight this particular nugget of history. Then, after that, there's a prayer. I'm just kind of reading to y'all. I'm sorry if this feels boring, but the prayer, Lord, help me see each individual as you do for the person and not for the outward appearance of skin color. So that's one day in this book, right? Yes, Do you remember even writing that? I mean, yes, I do. Okay. And it's interesting because there's a lot of controversy about Andrew Jackson. Right, right, and right. Was he racist prejudiced and all the rest, racist, right? And yet here, he was one of the first to give colors the opportunity not only to serve in the military, but to reward them with land at home. So it was, uh, you wonder how that happened and how he reacted as president later on because we do change and yet that was an opportunity I wanted people to realize that even then when there were some people who would look upon someone of because of their skin color downward there were others who would lift them up and that what we want to do is find those rich stories where people lift them up so that our hearts will lift up every individual mm. Now, I particularly like this because 
again, I'm, I've been recently doing some of my own reading on American history and and uh, thinking about screenplays. But what you just said is we we can we can sort of. Uh, paint a picture of a historical person, can't we? Yes. And that person's not here to speak for themselves. Exactly. Well, they died 300 years ago, 200 years ago, 100 years ago. And historians, what's your perspective? They color history, do they not? They do. And it depends on what they find. And, you know, that's why I use every story has an excerpt or some sort of quote from that person so we hear their voice and you didn't read Andrew Jackson's quote you might want to now let me read a part of it right now this is from Andrew Jackson soldiers the president of the United States shall hear how praiseworthy was your conduct in the hour of danger and the representatives of the American people will give you praise for your exploits that's Andrew Jackson praising his soldiers of color in his own words. In his own words. And I think what we sometimes need to do is hear their voices. And so this is not just a story of history always, but I'm using the words of these people, and I want to bring that out. And that one particularly is about some of the men. Most of the time I'm writing more about the women and their words and what they have to say. But I do think it's important that we understand the stories that have not been told. And that story on Andrew Jackson is a more hidden story we don't hear. Mm. I think that has happened, uh, again, I'm not a historian, and I could probably uh, stand to learn a lot, but I have appreciated the writers that I've been reading when they do the same thing that you're doing, and that is to not sort of summarize their opinion of the character, but look up original source material that the characters themselves left, because they were proficient writers in those days. They wrote in long hand. We throw out tweets, and they'll probably last forever, but these uh, founders, they wrote their thoughts with some thoughtfulness and I love that you bring us back and and you introduce us to them L let's talk about another one again I just think these are interesting so this one comes um, on the date of February 12th and you titled this chapter sufficiently scared you remember this one <laughs> I do with Ann Whittle all right why don't you set it up you're the author why am I reading your works tell us about sufficiently scared all right well this is a Quaker woman and Quakers did not want to be involved in any battles, and the battle ended up on her front yard. Not only did it end up on her front yard, they raised, in other words, they cut down all of the apple orchard in her front yard in one day, waiting for the British to come and attack. And at that point, the story before this is about Jonas, a young Native American, part Native American, who was put in prison the night before by the British so that he could not tell because they thought he overheard what they were going to do. Well, he was such a swift runner. When he got out in the morning, he raced to Red Hill, and he told them what was going to happen at Ann Whittle's house. And where, the general, is the, where is this happening? This by is them? in New Jersey. Okay. All okay. right. And what year? And, um... This is 1777, and at this point the general turns all of the cannons around because now they know where the British are going to come from. They thought they were going to be surprising the Ameri well, the colonists, okay? And at that point the colonists surprised them and won the battle, one of the first victories in the American Revolution. And she's talking about how she was not going to be scared. She's just trusting in God. And she has decided she will stay in her home and continue weaving. But a cannon came through the wall. You can still see that in that home. And she picked up her spinning wheel and she went down to her basement. <laughs> A cannonball came through the wall? Yes, it a came cannonball. through the wall okay. and landed right next to her feet. Oh, my goodness. And that's when she decided she would go downstairs. And so she talks about this, September 24, 1777. Yesterday, which was the 24th of September, two Virginia officers called at our house and informed us that the British Army has crossed Scully Kill. Presently, after another um, person sh uh, stopped and confirmed what they had said, and that General Washington and Army uh, were near uh, Potts Grove. Well, thee will be sure we were sufficiently scared. However, the road was still evening. And uh, this is, uh, you know, just part of an excerpt from her diary. 
uh, an interesting thing is after the battle, she was called a ministering angel. And the book even has a picture of that home, and which she allowed them to bring in all the soldiers were wounded from both sides. And she used the herbs from her herb garden to help heal these men, these soldiers. And she scolded anyone who tried to argue or fight with the enemy that they and said, no, this is a home of peace. You cannot fight here. <laughs> because this is a uh, devotional book, I think, you know, you're, you're, you're as an author expecting people to read these, you know, in short chunks, which means this book could stay on your coffee table or on your bedstand for a full year if you were to spend the time. And you, your idea is a story a day and then a prayer a day. Is that How, how would you like a people story, to use this? A story, a scripture, and a prayer a day. Yes, so that they can see how people put faith into action. There are these scriptures, there are people, and many times you see what they even read in the Bible or hear about that, as well as a prayer of how their courage can translate to our courage today with whatever we are facing. Now, I'm fascinated by these stories um, because I'm assuming that you have found them through various sources, right? That you didn't just go Wikipedia all this, right? No, we didn't Wikipedia anything. (laughs) All right. So how did you find these stories and how do you research them? We, my co-author and I went to the sources. She went to the Alamo. She's west of the Mississippi. She's in Iowa. I went from Florida on up to John Adams Library at historic societies and places. Also online, many colleges have taken and digitalized the old journals and stories, and so I was able to read those, get permissions to use them if I needed to, that type of thing. Anything, of course, before 1914 was not under copyright, so it was the newer ones we had to worry about on that. And you'll find that the back of the book has a ton of endnotes because everything has been documented in there as to the source that we used for it. You know, Karen, I think it would be easier to write fiction. You just make it up as you go. <laughs> this, this looks like this was a, a, a pretty in-depth pro- How long did it take you to do this? We were given nine months, which is why I decided to get a co-author. <laughs> wow. Given by, who's the publisher? Uh, AMG Publishing out of Chattanooga, Tennessee. They're a pretty old publisher. They've been around for over 100 years. And tell me, again, as an author, what gives you satisfaction? You put nine months into a work like this. What actually makes you feel good? When I know it's impacted lives, when people have cared about that. This particular book, my husband was still alive when it came out. He served. He was so behind my writing it, and he so loved that he was able to see it. He'd heard the story as I was writing it, and he passed away a few months later. So that made a difference for me. And it made a difference because as a military wife, I could share these stories for women to read about. Here's what others have said about this book, Karen. Here's one. This this historic look at over 250 years of families standing firm in the midst of war shows their faith and courage while holding on to the hope for the safe return of their loved ones. Each story reveals the untold heroes of past wars and brings us encouragement to use their examples to live out these same principles as we face our trials today. You look at America today, what do you see? Are we losing the principles, the faith, the pain, We're losing the principles, we're losing the true stories, and we're being taught on true stories because they are recoloring history, they're repainting it, and that's why I believe we should use original sources, and this nonfiction book uses original sources from beginning to end. Mm. Well, I love this, Karen. I thank you for doing this. I told you the other day, I wish we could make a film of every one of the stories. We're launching America Studios for the exact same reasons that you just mentioned. It costs a lot of money to make a film, and so we're trying to find enough people to invest in these films that that we can make them at the highest quality. It takes a lot of investment of your time, passion, the support of your family, your husband, your experience as a military wife and mother to have the heart to put this together and the diligence to do it. Um, How can people buy it? Where can they find it? 
they can get this anywhere books are sold because uh, my books are always with traditional publishers and therefore any bookstore can order them. They can go online. They can go to my website, karenwhiting.com, if they want an autographed copy. But they can also go to my book page and from there click through to find any of the books at the places they shop at. Karenwhiting.com, W-H-I-T-I-N-G, Karen, K-A-R-E-N, Karenwhiting.com. You know, maybe it's... Uh, Maybe this is a good book uh, for you. I mean, would you like to stand on the shoulders of the people that preserved our freedom? And one way you can stand on their shoulders is to remember them and to be inspired by them. And maybe if we were to learn these stories and teach them, we wouldn't be so quick to throw away so many of the things they fought for. And it feels like we're throwing them away on a daily basis right now. Oh, yes, I think so. And we're downgrading what they have done. And it it even has the modern stories of Iraq. It's got the story of my mother-in-law, who was on the team that broke the Japanese code that helped us us win World War II. There are women who did many things. There are politicians. There are so many people in there. And to me, it was important to tell these stories. I, I really loved finding stories to be able to share. Is, there's a beautiful picture of a woman's face in the cover. Is she somebody that we should know? No. Is that Betsy Ross? <laughs> no, I wish. We, but that Blue Star background is from the flag of the Blue Star Moms. Tell me uh, about the flag of the Blue Star Moms. Well, you know, between the two world wars, we really began that whole Blue Star and Gold Star Moms. And I am a Blue Star Mom, but I'm so thankful I'm not a Gold Star Mom. When you graduate to Gold Star, it means your service person has died in battle, it died in service. And so that's not a good thing. But particularly in World War II, people would put those little flags on the window for each child, put a blue star up, so people would know as they went by who was serving, that there were people serving from that family, and they could pray for them. And even now, there's a few blue star theaters in this country that will perform things or have dramatic readings and and share and have events about this. There are blue star mom groups around the country. When I was in Maryland and my son went to Iraq and left his family with us, they gathered together because they they couldn't bring all their things and brought over toys and everything for the children to have while Michael was serving. And we would also get together and do care packages for people who were serving from our area that we knew of and send those out. How would you answer the integration? We we call the No Shame podcast at at the crossroads of, of faith and culture. So an author writing historical books of your, but, but you've obviously integrated the deepest truths of your faith into your writing. How do those blend? How do you blend research and your faith in the Lord? Well, I do it in a couple of ways. One way is certainly by sharing these stories that bring out the faith. I know when I did like Eleanor Roosevelt, I did th- read three biographies of her in a day so that I could find her faith statement to put in there. And the only st- story in there that does not share faith was from a newspaper account of the Nuremberg trials where somebody said, how could you do this to one of the commandants of a concentration camp? Do you believe in God? And the answer was absolutely not. And I wanted at that point to show the absence of faith. So sometimes it's that contrast. When I'm doing a book for families or for children, then I'm showing them how to apply faith in their life and how it can make a difference for them. And especially with a family book, how can we raise our children with faith and sharing not only stories but hands-on activities to do because kids want to get involved and do something and they'll remember it better. So I approach the children and families a little bit different than if it's just for the adults. Five children of your own, right? Yes, and 12 grands. 12 grandchildren of your own? Yes. So you know a little bit about raising families. Do people read anymore, and why should they, or why not? You know, I'm always surprised. I did a devotional for boys, for active boys. And I thought, well, they really read a whole year. And instead, the letters I got back was, my son just loved it so much he couldn't wait. He read it all in a month. And there were so many boys who read that so quickly because they really liked it. And that's when you know it makes a difference. They, they're reading it, and they would reread it again. Do you get, do you get correspondence much, and, and how does it come to you? Not all that often, but I do get them by, by email or through my Facebook page. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
Well, Karen, when you sit down to write, you told me you kind of start writing things here and there. Tell me a little bit about your process. Where where do you go? Do you, are you in the kitchen at the table? Do you go to an office? Uh, uh, where do you go? Yeah, I have an office in my house, so I'm sitting there and I start brainstorming. Sometimes I'm actually jotting things down and have a clipboard that I walk around with and sit down and use or go outside to my herb garden. And then when I start having all these ideas, and a big thing I do is how will it benefit someone? Who, why would a reader want this book? Because there's no sense reading it if nobody wants to read it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, <laughs> no mm -hmm, sense writing mm -hmm. it if no one's going to be there to read it. And then I start doing a spreadsheet of what would go in each chapter or each day if it's a daily devotional or a weekly devotional. And when I'm done with that, then I know I have a book content and I can write the proposal and pitch it. And when I get a contract, then I know I have the outline that I can write it. What's an author contract look like for you? Do you, you work with a different publisher? <laughs> I've worked with 12 different publishers because right. they don't all publish the same type of thing. And, of course, I have a literary agent, and that makes a difference, too. And I go through that, of course, to look at the details. And I always want to see what my uh, advance is as well as what my... Um, discount is because I want to get enough of a discount that I can sell it at a good price for people or that I can also give them away to the people who need to have one that I believe God wants me to share that with. But it's just, uh, you know, it's that's the business side of things. I'm a mathematician, so I do look at that from those eyes. To, and, you know, at one time I did taxes for people too, so I have that business background and I can look at it from that perspective. Mm -hmm. Now you're uh, one other thing I want to ask you about is uh, there's an organization here. I, I heard you are like the treasurer of Cannes, and I thought that meant you were part of the French Film Festival, but <laughs> apparently I was wrong. What's Cannes? Christian Authors Network is a nonprofit organization for traditionally published authors. You have to have at least one book with a traditional publisher that does Christian books. It could be a division of a larger publisher that does Christian books. And a second book that can either be traditional or that one could be indie. And we are there to help promote one another's books, to help share marketing ideas and help our people understand the marketing side of publishing. If someone is out there listening to you, Karen, and they want to join CAN, can they do it? If they meet our qualifications, they can go to ChristianAuthorsNetwork.com, look at the application. If they're ready and know that they would be accepted, they can do an application. If they are not there yet, then they can start knowing that this is a goal, that when I get there, when I get my published books, then I'm going to apply to that. Meanwhile, they can follow our blog and see what else we're doing and learn some marketing from us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it's... Um... <laughs> This is such a cliche, but it's good to read. And, and, you know, and I love to read, and I wish I had time to read more. We'll never have a chance to read all the things in the world that we'd like to get our hands on. But uh, I think Karen Whiting's books are probably the kind of books that should be open in your house, that you're, that you're growing in your life when you're reading. Um, we're looking at 52 weekly devotions for families called to serve, which we've mentioned. We've dived, dove more deeply into this wonderful, big, thick, cool-looking book called Stories of Faith and Courage from the Homefront. I encourage you to go to KarenWhiting.com, get to know Karen, and I encourage you to keep writing. you got to get up there so you're taken seriously. Yeah, 26 books, 800 articles. Thank you for your contribution to the world to our generation and to generations to come because our books will outlast us all. Hopefully they will. And I thank you so much, John, for this time to be able to chat with you and your audience. Have no shame. No Shame is a weekly podcast where John Groders discusses life at the intersection of faith and culture with all kinds of interesting and inspiring guests. Subscribe to the podcast today by going to johngroders.com, select the podcast tab, and hit subscribe. Listen whenever you have time, but don't miss any of these life-giving conversations. No